media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Mark Leibovit, editor and publisher of the Leibovit VR Newsletters, also known as VRTrader.com. He's speaking to us from Arizona. Welcome back to the show, Mark. Glad to be here, Jim. And, uh... We do have a disclaimer. Uh, we're not financial advisors, nor provide financial advice here at uh, VR Trader. More of an educational uh, service for decades, but we do uh, talk about the markets and uh, sectors. Do you still have a special offer for our listeners? Yeah, we do. Only for you guys. VRTrader.com, and we get 50% off if you enter the promo code 2022 half off. 2022-H-A-L-F-O-F-F, and that applies for any newsletter, any time frame you sign up for. Mark, uh, any big shockwaves from the Fed's latest interest rate hike? Well, you know, it was really a wild day on Wednesday. You know, market was up and down a little, and then for some reason they, they probably pulled the plug in that last uh Hour, the Dow dropped about, you know, 500 points and it was weak again a little bit, uh, today. But, uh, nothing unexpected. I mean, the Fed, you know, though I feel the institution should be abolished and it's, it's funny because I've been talking about this for a while. I know it sounds crazy. I'm also talking about abolishing the 16th Amendment, which would eliminate income tax in the United States. That's one way to help keep the IRS agents uh, away from you, which is being, you know, funded now here. So that's a whole other discussion about what the government is doing and how it's attacking its own people. But uh, the Fed's been attacking us for uh, over 100 years since it was created in uh, 2013, 1913, and uh, here we are 110 years uh, later. And, uh, um, you know, even Ben Bernanke stated... Uh, that yes, it's our fault. Uh, we're responsible. Uh, we helped uh, uh, precipitate the crash, uh, uh, the depression back in um, you know in the 1930s, and you know, the, and, you, and you have some statistics too on this whole institution. Of course, we can't only blame the Fed, Congress here, and I guess institutions all over the world. You know, uh, the uh, congressional type investors people they're looking to spend money and uh i just it's funny it's just i said investors when i meant political people but you know you look at people like uh um leaders um in our government who have profited from stock trades and so forth with inside information so i guess a lot of the congress and senate uh, members at least here you know the they like the inside information and over the decades they pro they profited from it but you know they're spending a lot of money, which uh, which is something both Democrats and Republicans, and I guess uh, liberals and conservatives in Canada like to do as well on occasion. And that's tough to balance off when you're a uh, um, you know a monetary bank like the Federal Reserve or the Bank of Canada uh, when you have an opposite part of the government doing different things than you're doing, and you're trying to contra you know, contradicted in some way or improve things. So here we have an institution fed, which has made a lot of mistakes, always late, always, uh, you know, in the position of making the wrong decision. Economists probably know least about the economy and the stock market as anybody you can imagine. Um, and then, um, you know, and then you've got the uh, Congress here spending money like a drunken sailor. And you got world inflation issues. You got war issues, which I've been talking about a long time. It's not only the Fed that's going on in Europe. Geocosmic issues. So Putin is out there. You know, he made the headlines the last couple of days. I've been writing about this for a while. That the real story was potential war, since the Democrats uh, in this country have been out to get Russia for a long time. Hillary Clinton leading the way. And it's stupid because, uh, you know, he, it, it's a war, uh, you know, it's a war in the West against Russia. I mean, even uh, Putin came out and stated that, 
and you know that's made the markets a little jittery. But you know, like I said, I've been writing about this for quite some time. So you know, it's I don't know how it's all going to play out. There's nuclear risk out there, um, and um, you know, Putin wants to be independent. He doesn't want to conform to the rules of the West. And he even talks about, you know, how we spend money like crazy, how our currency is uh, is worthless, and, you know, he's into uh, natural resources and gold and things that back the ruble, and he's right. And we've been doing the wrong thing. The West is going downhill, and uh, we're going, you know, we're, we're never going to pay off debt, uh, and, you know, eventually, you know, he, he wants to keep out of that loop. So he's trying to keep his independence, and I admire him for that. And, uh, you know, the West, West Europe, here in the U.S., we're all greedy and stupid, and we're making the wrong decisions, but yet we want to take him out because he's a barrier to us. You know, get rid of Russia, then we can spend money even more crazily and do more stupid things, and not to mention the loss of our freedoms and the crazy woke movement and the global warming movement and all this nonsense that's out there is, you know, Western... uh philosophy and you know he doesn't want to go along with that i don't think china does either honestly i mean i think north korea china uh, iran probably is in that category there's other parts of the world that want to conform to what we're saying or doing so you know that's going to be a uh, you know problem here we'll see how it's all uh resolved so i'm trying to be optimistic but most of the, my you know intuition and uh insight into the market says this is not going away so fast so it could be rough for a while but there are going to be tradable rallies and here we are it's the autumnal equinox coming up tomorrow and i had written for a while will it be another low or another high and i keep putting charts in my uh newsletter and we know we saw a low within a couple of days of the uh the summer solstice and uh since we're into this you know september 23rd time frame and markets making relative lows not big lows yet they haven't taken out the summer lows which probably is still coming but you know, we're in this time frame where the market uh, moved down into the uh, into the autumnal equinox. So here we are, and it worked, and it was a time frame to pay attention to. So let's see how it all plays out. This is a time of year where we usually get, you know, some volatility. Um, September 25th, by the way, is the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, and that's two days. And then you've got a week later, the uh, Yom Kippur, the High Holy Days, on October 4th, 5th, and there's an old adage about, you know, do you buy Rosh Hashanah and sell Yom Kippur, or is it the other way around? And, you know, a lot of traders have, you know, for the last, my 40 years of doing this, have argued, you know, one could be a change point in the market or not. So we'll see how it all plays out. So, uh, you know, maybe we'll hit a little market low here for a few days tied to the uh, Rosh Hashanah holiday. And, it's you know, the, the cycle is based on lunar events, it's, you know, it, it's time to the the moon and so forth so maybe that has you know part and parcel uh you know to the uh p- possible change here that we uh you know, would likely see because we do have you know full moon we had a full moon on september 10th and we have a new moon on the 25th which is just just as rosh hashanah is as beginning and sometimes you get change of directions around that lunar cycle which i've talked about ad nauseum here so um you know, I, I'm not bullish, but, you know, we've hit a little cycle point, so maybe we get a, a bounce here. We'll see how it unfolds, but uh, we're waiting for more, you know, technical confirmation, and, and we do have an aggressive Fed out there, and we do have the European war situation. So we got to, you know, play it, play it carefully here. But, uh, you know, I, I'm not in the camp that, gee, we're going to hit some major bottom, and we're starting a bull market here, and it's going to rip and roar to the upside. I, I don't see that coming for a while. I just think there's too much damage or too much potential damage going forward. So uh, um, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, and we'll make trading decisions uh, as uh, the numbers dictate. We'll have more with Mark Leibovit right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Mark Leibovit. Mark, the Japanese government for the first time since 1998 has supplied support to the Japanese yen. It worked for a day, but they're on their way back down again. Are governments wasting their money 
trying to support their currency when right now the world's in crisis and they always go to the senior currency in times of trouble? I agree. You know, um, I've been talking a little bit about Japan and is, are they ready for a meltdown? You know, they own over 80% of all the ETFs in Japan and not to mention you, you're referring, of course, to the currency involvement. But, uh, you know, basically, uh, they virtually own the entire government bond market in Japan. Um, I think it amounts to about $4.5 trillion as of March. And that's about 90% of the country's economy. So, um, you know, there's also some story that sellers in the Japanese bond market failed to deliver securities, um, to three and a half trillion yen in the face, um, in, in face value a couple months ago. So there's, you know, there's, 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 there's problems there in, internally, you know, uh, you know, that's going to bust at some point. I mean, you know, the government can't own the market and it can't forever support its currency and, um, you know, the government vowed to keep the yield of its government bonds low at zero percent. So they're sort of doing the opposite of what the Fed's doing. So that's really interesting. You know, they're trying to stimulate uh, their their economy, and where we're trying to slow it down here. So how that all oh, that's going to play out, you know, is really really interesting. You know, for many years there was an arbitrage, you know, between J- J- the Japanese yen and the other currencies because of interest rate differential and so forth, and Many traders would be, you know, buying securities in Japan and selling them here and using the financing of low rates over there to accomplish that. And that's going back for many, many years. So, um, many, you know, I think that's another bomb to explode over there. I mean, basically they're, they're a little crazy, but I agree with the lower rates part of the scenario, but, how can a government control the bond and, and stock market? I mean, honestly, maybe that's part and parcel to the what's happening here uh, in the in you know North America. I mean, we know the Fed's in there buying stocks and bonds and doing a lot of things they don't talk about publicly. All they talk about is interest rates and you know um, uh, quantitative easing or the, the inverse of quantitative uh, easing and all that nonsense. But they don't talk about the other surreptitious activities. At least Japan is honest about what they're doing in terms of being involved in the markets, but. I hope I answered your question. I just think it's another bomb about to explode over there with them overly invested in securities, particularly if the U.S. market over the next year or two it goes lower, which I still think is a risk. Is this a, a time to take a look at gold, gold miners, gold stocks? You know, I really want to, uh, and, um, you know, we're in there. We have our foot in the door, but you know, the market doesn't seem to want to move. Part of it is that it's manipulated. You know, we, we pound the table on this and, you know, people look at you with open eyes like you're nuts, but it's a manipulated market. It's a suppressed market. And, you know, governments, particularly our government, doesn't want gold to take off because it makes them look bad. They already look bad anyway, but, uh, this really makes them look bad. Um, the charts say that a lot's dependent, of course, on the U.S. dollar. But there are hard times where sometimes gold and the dollar move in the same directions up and down. They don't always work, work inversely, which is what, you know, so the rule everybody's following, uh, dictates. Um, so, you know, seasonality says you should get some type of rally into the, into the winter. But I think it's a lot to do with, uh, you know, what the U.S. dollar does. And unless, uh, it's going to fight it and go along with the dollar, it sure looks oversold to me. I mean, there are some stocks out there, I don't want to mention names in, in the gold sector, that are, you know, yielding up to 5% in, a, in dividends right now. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you, you know, there was a big double top in gold, Jim. I mean, this is going back, you know, the 20 to 22, uh, in the last, you know, two, three years, two double tops in that 2060, 27 area, and I kept writing about it. And there's an expression on Wall Street, if you see a double top, you sell a double top. And until we really get through those big numbers, you really can't build any strong bull case. Of course, as a long-termer, you want a dollar cost average or buy cheaper. You don't want to buy only breakouts into new highs. So, you know, I I think long-term, uh, it makes sense that, you know, you, you do a little nibbling, but, you know, that with that negative technical formation, you know, uh, you know, you could drop down about 1500 in gold. 
uh, and, and still be, you know, big picture up again. So, you, you, you know, you can't jump in here with b- both feet, but, you know, it, it looks attractive. But obviously, if we see that dollar start to sell off, that could give a little impetus to a uh, gold and silver rally. And, you know, a lot depends, of course, what's going on in, in the war situation in Europe and whether there's going to be a flight to safety into uh, precious metals, which... You know, every dog has its day, so we'll, we'll see when the next big rally starts. It's not clear here. We are holding some, but um, the best I would hope for here short term is maybe a little bounce, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. What do you think is going to happen with crude and natural gas as we head into the colder months? They have to go. They have to go higher. I mean, it's a real serious situation over there. I mean, on the charts. It looks like, you know, crude oil could back off a little bit more, maybe even into the mid uh, $70 a barrel range. I could see that technically, which, by the way, helped the stock market. That would, you know, people start getting excited about stocks when that happens, and maybe that co- uh, coincides with a little pullback in the dollar at the time. So, uh, but overall trend is, is, in my opinion, is, is way, way higher. You know, governments against new exploration and development. Gover- countries don't, uh, computer co- companies don't want to spend money, you know, when, when the government is against them politically. And, um, you know, it's, the shortages is, is coming. And my comment is probably more than between now and the end of the year. I mean, looking into the next couple, three years, I just can only see crude and natural gas going higher because of suppression on the part of governments, because of stupid policies that said you shouldn't be producing it when we really need it. So, um, yeah, I'm, um, tra- on a trading comment, maybe we see crude oil back off a little bit more, which stimulates a little bounce in the stock market, but it, it would be just a temporary pullback, and I think going into next year, I, I still think crude could be, you know, I mean, I can see crude at $200 a, a barrel a year out from now. You know, that's how bullish I am, but we'll see. Mark, anything else we should be keeping a close eye on right now? No, I just, uh, I'm watching the key cycles here. You know, we're in the time frame for some type of cyclical low tied to the, uh, equinox and my models and everything. You know, usually it's the late September, October period. And if we do bounce out of here, it'd be interesting to see what, uh, really triggers it. You know, one of my models says we could be down all the way through November. It doesn't have to be here. So we're just going to have to wait for some, uh, you know, trigger events, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, some geocosmic event, whether it's some political event in Europe, whether the Fed suddenly changes its mind, which doesn't appear to be the case, and, you know, uh, decides that it's not going to get as aggressive. But if, for that to happen, Jim, I think there would have to be some type of outlier event. Something else would have to trigger trigger that. So, you know, bottom line, I think we're in a uh, longer-term bear market. Uh, I don't know how else to say it. I mean, I've been talking about some really low numbers here, the next couple of years, but we we are going to get uh, rallies, and uh, we'll just have to sort of focus on you know where the strongest opportunities is. Just in passing, we know solar stocks have been strong, but they already had a big rally, so you got to watch those. And we watch you know gold and silver if we get a trigger, and um, and if uh, crude oil comes down enough, it might be another trading buy. So that's sort of where I'm at. Mark, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks for having me. My guest has been Mark Leibovit, editor and publisher of the Leibovit VR newsletters, also known as VRTrader.com. If you have any questions for Mark or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on BitChute at Talk Digital Network. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.